right, this video we're doing an installation of an X-Series UEGO gauge from AEM, also known as an AFR gauge. UEGO is Universal Exhaust Gas Oxygen Gauge. And so it comes with a Bosch oxygen sensor. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. It comes with a bung that you can weld on to your exhaust uh, wherever you want to install. I'll talk about where I'm installing it on my car. It comes with this harness. This is for wiring the power and ground to the gauge, but also a lot of optional outputs, which I'll talk about. A rubber band, which is really great and used for me along with this CJM gauge extender to mount in the pod. All right, so this gauge has the ability to have several different output options. You can have AEM net outputs, you can have some analog outputs, you can have serial outputs, depending on what type of system you want to interact with. You can use it for tuning. A lot of tuning devices will accept these outputs as an input. All we really need for this install, since I'm running it as a standalone gauge, I'm not using it for tuning, I'm not using it to connect to the ECU, is the red and black wire on this wiring harness. So I'm going to depin all the others to cut out all the extra clutter and skinny this down. Now, in the previous video I did on the boost gauge, you'll see all of this stuff that I'm showing right now, getting the gauge uh, installed into the pod, connecting the power and ground, getting the wires run, identifying a power source and a ground location, and then getting the cables through the firewall. So all of that was done in the previous video because it made sense to do the boost and the AFR gauge at the same time so that I could just run everything together. This video, we're going to specifically now talk about installation of the sensor, how it looks when you're using the gauge, and then some of the options that it has available. All right, this gauge, it's actually super fast. I, I found this article that talked about the response time of different gauges. This thing has a response time of like 20 milliseconds. Look at the top of the list. That's where you'll find the AEM X-Series gauges. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Comes with a Bosch. LSU 4.9 sensor. So there are some specific guidelines for sensor placement in the vehicle. According to the instructions, it needs to be 18 inches downstream of the cylinder head's exhaust port or turbocharger in this case. It needs to be upstream of any catalytic converter or emission control devices. It needs to be downstream of any turbochargers as far away from the exhaust exit to avoid getting in fresh air that you don't want. So talking about the the distance from the turbocharger. There's a lot of differing opinions on that. In fact, AEM did a video on this very gauge and the associated sensor. We recommend mounting the sensor about 12 to 36 inches downstream from the exhaust exit. Now that's from the hot side of the turbo or from the head of the engine in a naturally aspirated setup. So he says 12 to 36 inches. The instruction manual says 18 inches. Another resource from a different gauge says it should be 24 inches away. And so I checked the Bosch instructions and it's less than helpful. It says, put it at a point where the gas is as hot as possible, but not too hot. So this is the downpipe I have in the car. This is a track slag four inch downpipe. Uh, it's hard to show you because it's in the car. So here's how it looks against a factory downpipe. And then here's another downpipe I happen to have in my garage right now. And the bung location for the rear O2 sensor is in the same position on all of those. I tell you that because I'm gonna use that rear bung position for this wideband oxygen sensor. Now, the car that I have, a 2019 Golf R, has a wideband O2 sensor that is at the turbo. That is what the ECU uses to control engine functions. Then there is this downstream O2 sensor, which from the factory is a narrow band past the cat and it's monitoring catalytic efficiency. The reason that this is available to me is because I unplugged that sensor a long time ago at the recommendation of my tuner, Equilibrium Tuning. And so I've been running that way for a long time. My factory O2 sensor is in there, but it's basically just a bung plug because uh, it's not connected to anything. So I'm gonna remove that and I'm gonna install the wideband sensor 
into that, that saves me the trouble of having to weld anything. Now, how am I able to do this? First of all, it fits within the parameters of the distances that you want to be from the turbo outlet. In this case, if you look, it's probably gonna be about 16 inches away from the turbo. This also works for me because the downpipe I'm using, that track slag, doesn't have a catalytic converter in it. My catalytic converter is elsewhere. So that's a bonus for me. If you still have a catalytic converter in that position, you should realistically have somebody weld a bung up at the top here of the downpipe. That will move it a little bit closer. You'll get a little faster response time. Still should be outside of the range of excessive exhaust temperatures. A lot of people run it there without any issues. Here's a look at this Bosch oxygen sensor as it's installed in the car right now. So let me catch you up to how I got to this point. All right, to remove the factory O2 sensor, I'm gonna use this carbine O2 sensor socket at seven eighths inch or 22 millimeter. And if you're not familiar with these, I'll show you how it works. Basically it has a slot that allows you to slip it over the oxygen sensor and then three eighths inch ratchet on there. I'm using a half inch breaker bar to break that free. A lot of people struggle with getting that factory O2 sensor loose out of there. I'll show you here, but a short little four inch extension and a breaker bar does wonders. I'll show you once I get that out. Remember that this oxygen sensor is already unplugged, so that cable should be free to spin around. And then once I get it broken loose, I can remove it by hand. And there you go. And there's the factory sensor. So here's what I'm using, a half inch to three eighths inch conversion, and then a little four inch extension. And that gets me a height of the head of the ratchet or breaker bar that gives me plenty of room to work. So the new O2 sensor comes with NSCs. So all we have to do really is just install it in place of the one we just removed. So by hand, I'm going down there and tightening it up and you can see how I spin the cable along with it so nothing gets bound up. Then my extension goes in there with the O2 socket attached. And I'm gonna tighten this down snug and just oof, a little bit more. You don't have to over tighten this. Uh, think of it more like spark plug torque. And there you go. Now I can plug the sensor cable into the cable that's coming out of the inside of the vehicle from the gauge. And then I'm just gonna set this up in a way that gives me uh, enough room that I can get the sensor cable pushed away from the turbo and the downpipe. I'm also using this heat wrap for cables. It's a little bit big for this single cable, but what I like about it is it allows the ability to flatten out, which lets me put it up there behind the heat shield for the analog brake system. And then also allows me to put the heat shield all the way down around the O2 sensor itself. So it should be well protected from heat down there. So once we fire the car up, you'll see it will go into a heat cycle. It does that uh, every single time you start the car. The O2 sensor is gonna preheat a little bit. You shouldn't wait to let it heat up before you start the car. You want the sensor heating up at the same time the engine is heating up. All right, once we're there, I'll show you uh, the mode button here, which will let you cycle through the different menu options. This is where you would change it from a three digit to a four digit display or vice versa. You can change it from AFR mode to a Lambda mode. I'll explain that. You can change it to display the oxygen percent mode. ACAL is for a free air calibration. And you can also change to a resistor trim calibration mode as well. But there's no need to calibrate this when you install it. It comes pre-calibrated. And then this is if you're connected using one of those outputs to the AEM net, you can change your CAN message ID. All right, here's a look at moving to a three digit mode. Uh, just basically shows three digits instead of four. Now I'm back to four digits. If you hit select, it'll show done when your selection has been accepted. Changing to AFR gives you the more familiar air fuel ratio, which is really fake. <laughs> uh, lambda LA is the actual reading where one Lambda is stoic, and that's the optimum air fuel ratio for complete combustion. Anything higher than one is lean. Anything lower than one is rich. Air fuel ratio, which is based off of unleaded gasoline and the stoichiometric value of 14.65 to one. That's 14.65 units of air to one unit of fuel. 
Unfortunately, that's really only accurate if you're using unleaded gasoline, like you would get at the gas pumps uh, normally, unleaded, super unleaded, premium unleaded, all that stuff. If you're using anything outside of that, like I am, I'm running E85, then it's going to have a different stoic ratio. It's closer to 9.8. Uh, or so. If you're running pure ethanol, it would be nine. If you're running methanol, it would be, you know, six and a half or so. But the reality of it is the gauge doesn't know what kind of fuel you're running. So it just assumes everything is unleaded gasoline. And so even though my stoic might show 14.65 here on the gauge or, you know, whatever it might say, or that I'm running 11 uh, to one or 17 to one, I'm not really running that. It's just, that's what it's interpreting it as. The good news is it doesn't really matter what type of fuel you're running as long as you all know that that's a normalized value. But the better way for me is to look at the Lambda uh, values, which is the original unconverted value where stoichiometric is one. And I don't have to do math on is above 14 or below 14. It's like, oh, one, that's an easy number. Less than one is rich, higher than one is lean. I don't have to do a lot of thinking. An air fuel ratio faceplate gives me an easy way to sort of self-convert. I can see the lambda display. I can see the sweeping needle of the gauge uh, and where it is. But based on that sweeping needle, I can also make a pretty decent estimate of what the air fuel ratio value would be in case I wanted to compare against somebody else who's talking AFR instead of Lambda. So it works perfectly for me. All right, so as we're driving around, notice a couple things. When the, the four dashes go across and the needle for the gauge goes all the way to 20, that's when you're off throttle. Uh, that is basically such a lean condition, you have no fuel coming in, which is what you'd expect when you get off the throttle. Normal cruising, your ECU is gonna try and, and keep stoic in mind. It's gonna try and stay around that one stoichiometric uh, ratio or you know 14.65. And then in cruising, it might uh, lean out a little bit for fuel efficiency. Efficiency. If you're giving it wide open throttle, it's going to want more power, so it's going to need more fuel. So you'll often see your tunes will revert to a much richer air fuel ratio down in the 11s uh, or so, or 0.8 on the lambda gauge. With regard to air fuel ratio, you can look at the values, look at the needle, look at a combination of the two, but basically what you'll see there is red on the right side of the stoic position, which is almost top dead center there, is worrisome, right? Particularly at wide open throttle, if you're, if you're lean, that's worrisome. Green on the left hand side of that is good, and that's basically because you want to be running with a richer air fuel ratio whenever you're giving it power at wide open throttle. So you can sort of look for patterns that you could come to expect from your vehicle. Uh, I know when I'm going to floor it, it's going to drop down to uh, 12 or 11 uh, AFR, somewhere in that range. If I see it do anything else or bump back over to 16 or 17 quickly, I know I had a fuel delivery issue of some sort. Uh, and risk, if that stays there, running into a lean condition where the engine uh, could be significantly damaged. So here's an example of that. Uh, I actually manifested a lean condition for you. So this is a wide open pull. And here you go. This is where it's gonna go lean. Boom, 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 you can see it go lean. And then I get off, what I did is I basically put it in manual mode and let it bang off the rev limiter at redline. And the way that the Volkswagen handles that is with a fuel cut. So you can see I'm cu it's cutting fuel, the ECU is cutting fuel, which is generating a lean situation, which is why you're seeing that needle bounce over there to lean. Uh, and that's something that might get my attention uh, if I was actually not already you know, manifesting the situation. So. Anyway, just some things to think about. One other thing to, to note is that this has an auto dimming feature. There's a sensor here at the top. When I cover that with my thumb, since it's daylight outside, you'll see uh, the gauge will dim. And then when I remove my thumb so it can see daylight again, uh, it will brighten up. Here's an example of a wide open throttle run, but you can see it running rich to the 0.8 uh, range. And then when there's a shift, there will be a throttle cut for the gear change. It will bump over to lean, back to rich, 
another gear change over to lean back to rich and then when i let off the throttle you'll see it will completely lean out because there is literally no fuel coming out the engine is just a big air pump at that point all right that's it i'm just gonna let you watch the rest of this driving video and i'm just gonna say if you have any questions let me know in the comments and as usual thanks for watching and i'll catch you on the next one